Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for logging on today to learn a little bit more about where drugs come from and what the challenges are nowadays in drug development. Um, before I get started, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. Uh, I'm a professor here at Tufts. I've been here for 10 years in the chemistry department. And I have taught um, classes in biochemistry and organic chemistry to over 1,000 Tufts undergrads and um, and I run a research lab, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my, what my research lab does at the uh, I started my academic journey at uh, the Cooper Union in uh, New York City as an engineering student. And then I did my graduate work at Yale University um, studying uh, the structures of drug molecules. And then did a postdoc in genetics and cell biology here in Boston at the Whitehead Institute. So I've been trained. Um, from engineering to chemistry to uh, biochemistry and genetics. Um, and I try to bring that interdisciplinary approach both to my teaching here at Tufts and also into my research. And that interdisciplinary approach is, of course, what's necessary for um, drug discovery in the 21st century. Um, this talk will be separated into three parts where we'll talk a little bit about what drugs are, um, how drugs are discovered, and how they have been discovered. Um, from ancient times to the present, and then we'll talk about the current challenges in the drug industry. So the first part, what are drugs? Um, I don't like to talk for long periods of time, which I think my students are really happy about, and so I usually try to do some question and answer. This is a difficult format to do it in, um, but I can present the question, um, what does the FDA actually require uh, for uh, drug approval? Which of these have to be scientifically proven? Um, safety in humans, the ability to actually make the drug in the lab, um, and effectiveness for a disease, especially compared to a current treatment, or a clear understanding of how the drug works at the chemical level. And you'll be surprised to know that um, only two of these are absolutely necessary. While the FDA likes to see as much as possible, it's safety and efficacy. And efficacy is compared to the current standard of treatment. You have to scientifically prove both of those things for your molecule to be approved as a drug. How do drugs work? These are uh, one or two slides from uh, my biochemistry lectures. I'm trying not to get too deep into textbook material here. Um, but drugs always have to work by binding something in the cell, usually a protein, which we'd call a receptor. Receptor is a general term for anything the drug binds. And this is a, a Latin quote from the early 20th century by a pioneer in drug development, Paul Ehrlich. Um, the Latin uh, translates to an agent cannot act without binding. If you're adding something to a biological system and it changes something about a biological system, uh, then it must be binding something, sticking to it in three dimensions and staying there, uh, blocking it to have that effect. And then there might be a signal that gets transduced to the cell, and the cell might respond. Uh, and that's how you get um, the response, whether it's turning on insulin production or killing a cancer cell. This is the technical way that we would talk about it in biochemistry. You would have a competitive inhibitor. Um, shown here is a molecule called dihydrofolate. It inhibits an enzyme uh, in your cells. Um, uh, it's a, a, pardon me, it's a natural substrate for an enzyme in your cells. Um, but here's methotrexate. It's a drug that looks a lot like dihydrofolate, but you can see a few small differences in methotrexate. And so you can imagine how methotrexate might bind the same molecules, the same proteins in your cells that dihydrofolate binds. Um, but instead of being able to um, have the same chemistry done on it, it just sits there and blocks it. And that's how most drugs work. They just find something in the cell, they sit there, and then they uh, gum it up and they block it. Um, and that's a lot of what we look at in a test tube when we're looking at how drugs work, is which proteins in your cells are they sticking to and which are they not. Um, that's all the textbook material I have. Hopefully that's uh, enough to, to whet your appetite. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the history of where drugs have come from. The idea of using substances to alter uh, disease is obviously as old as uh, m mankind itself, as old as civilization. Um, lots of great uh, traditional texts that describe using drugs to combat a disease. And in fact, the oldest and most reliable way of getting drugs has been from nature. So for instance, here's aspirin. Salicin is the natural form of aspirin, which you can, you can isolate from willow bark. 
Salicylic acid is a derivative of it. Hopefully, even if you don't understand these chemical line structures, you can see that salicylic acid and aspirin, all the way on the right, um, mimic the structure of salicin in a lot of important ways. And you can see that by the year 1900, aspirin was being synthesized and sold by the Bayer Company, and it still is today, uh, as an analgesic, as a pain reliever. There's lots of other great natural products. I show some here that are actually quite important, both in the history of chemistry, in the history of drug development, and even the history of Western culture. Quinine from chinchona bark uh, was sought as an anti-malarial for hundreds of years um, during the imperialist expansion of Europe uh, into the rest of the world. Um, but you can see it's actually quite a complex chemical structure. It wasn't actually chemically synthesized since the 1940s. That means that quinine and most of the quinine uh, that you have today, including quinine in ton tonic water and everywhere else, comes from chinchona bark and not from chemical synthesis. Um, the search for uh, a synthetic means of making quinine actually led to a lot of chemical discoveries in the 1800s, the, the push uh, to expand uh, Western civilization into the rest of, of the world actually uh, drove a lot of uh, ingenuity in the chemical industry to try to make some of these molecules. Uh, foxglove leaves, uh, long known as a poison, uh, as uh, the source of digitalis, which is a blood pressure medication. Uh, that's a very, very complex structure. Uh, lots and lots of um, O's and H's and bonds there. Um, and so that is definitely not synthesized in the lab. It was only first synthesized in the 1980s. And digitalis is still isolated from foxglove uh, as a medication. And then morphine and other opioids, again, also originally ident uh, known since ancient times and originally um, isolated from the seed pods of poppies. So natural products are the most enduring and still today one of the most reliable sources for new drugs. And that leads to the question of, well, if a lot of drugs come from natural sources, then um, what is the difference between a natural dietary supplement and a drug? And I like to turn that around and ask, well, what is, um, what is the actual regulatory hurdle between a dietary supplement and a drug? Um, do you have to show safety in humans? Do you have to list all the known bioactive substances in that extract? Do you have to show ex effectiveness for a specific disease or condition? Do you have to even describe the known effects on human physiology? And the answer to this question is none. Uh, the FDA monitors dietary supplements uh, only after they're out on the market, after they maybe start to have some adverse effects. That's the only time the FDA gets involved. And I'd like to stress that even um, drug developers, scientists both in the pharmaceutical industry and in academia such as myself, see no difference between molecules that are discovered in nature that can be used to treat disease or molecules that are discovered in a lab. The only difference is the burden of proof that you have to go through to be marketed as a drug or accepted as a drug. You have to prove safety and prove efficacy in humans for a specific indication if you want to call your molecule a drug. Um, but on the scientist, uh, scientific level, we see no difference between these two things. If it cures the disease, we're going to try to find that molecule and try to use it to cure a disease, um, whether it comes from natural sources or the lab. That's a little bit of the history of drug development. Where, uh, what is modern drug discovery like? What is drug discovery like in 2020? Um, this is a great cartoon by the cartoonist Sidney Harris that says, uh, it's a new drug, but recently discovered in the rainforest. Unfortunately, we have to go there to get it. And that is, uh, might make you chuckle a little bit, but it really illustrates what the drug industry is there for. It's there to find new and useful molecules Test them for safety and efficacy, because as I said, that is the, those are the two things that you need to show. Uh, and then manufacture them for sale, so that you don't have to go to the rainforest to get chinchona bark or seed pods uh, from poppy plants uh, to get therapies for your diseases. Max Tischler is the next uh, historical figure I like to talk about to take us from um, maybe the turn of the 20th century until today. Max Tischler is one of Tufts's most uh, uh, most illustrious uh, graduates, especially from the chemistry department. Um, he was a giant in the field of uh, organic chemistry and pharmaceuticals. He took Merck from a company that was selling 
vitamins in the 1900s to um, uh, through the first uh, production of penicillin and streptomycin, which were some of the first bacteria, uh, sorry, bacterial antibiotics, um, through the production of cortisone and other miracle drugs from the 40s and 50s. And these were discovered by screening soil samples to try to recreate the kind of serendipitous discovery, the, the chance discovery um, that was originally done by, uh, originally discovered by Alexander Fleming, uh, where he uh, accidentally discovered the mold that creates uh, penicillin. So having observed this once, there was this kind of forced, forced serendipity or forced luck where they would just screen all these different microorganisms to find ones that produced antibiotics. And that's where all these antibiotics from the 40s and 50s came from and where the majority still come from today. All of these are from natural sources. So that's a little bit of the history of drug development that takes us to today. Um, I'm gonna talk very briefly about five different areas of drug development. If you have questions about the history of drug development, um, please jot them down uh, so you can ask me at the end. I'd love to take questions on any parts of this presentation. So the second part, um, I'm going to go over uh, five different areas um, of drug discovery, starting with natural products. Natural products, uh, quote unquote, is what uh, drug developers call drugs from nature. Um, here's a great success story, uh, Taxol. Taxol was originally isolated from the bark of an endangered Pacific yew tree, and it still comes from the yew tree today. Um, you can see this crazy chemical structure over here to the right. Really crazy. It took decades and decades of organic chemists to try to figure out how to synthesize this molecule. Um, it was only first synthesized in 1994. And why I love talking about Taxol is not only is it still um, a commonly used breast cancer drug, um, but it operated by a very, very new mechanism it interfered with microtubules, which are the cellular skeleton at the cellular level that kind of hold the cell together. And I show a little uh, cellular diagram here. Microtubules are put together um, by a polymer of all these small proteins, which are shown in green and blue spheres in this uh, diagram on the bottom right. And what was really cool about Taxol is that the fact that people knew very little about microtubules until Taxol was discovered. And Taxol, the discovery of this drug, actually helped basic scientists learn how the cell skeleton was put together. And that's why people like myself, academics, are involved in drug development, is because we can ask questions that biologists can't answer by discovering new molecules that inhibit cellular processes that biologists don't even understand yet. Taxol is a great example of a drug that's still used today, and it's been used for decades, that actually taught biologists amazing amounts of basic cell biology. Beyond natural products, uh, which again has been one of the most reliable places for drugs, uh, one of the places where drugs have, have come from in the last 20 years or so is called high throughput screening. High throughput screening is a method of taking a large collection of drug-like molecules. If you're a large drug company, you may have millions of molecules in the freezer and you'd like to test these against as many different diseases as possible. And so you can actually train robots and show a little robotic arm here. And there's a great YouTube video that I don't have time to click on right now. Um, but I encourage you to look up some high throughput screening facilities. They show these great picture uh, videos of robots screening molecules, looking for molecules with the desired property. Um, it's kind of a brute force version of the forced serendipity I talk, told you about during the golden age of antibiotics. A great success story from screening uh, is Gleevec, which is a, um, one of the very first uh, targeted cancer drugs. I have a Time Magazine cover from 2001. Um, and in the last 20 years or so, these targeted uh, kinase inhibitors, as they're called, have been uh, more and more powerful drugs for, uh, for different types of cancer. And these were all discovered using high throughput screening methods. Another key element of uh, drug development currently is structure-based drug design. What this means is you're taking the exact 3D structure of your protein target, so of the biological protein in your cells that is causing all the problems. You isolate that and you get the 3D coordinates of every single atom in that protein and then figure out how your drug fits into it kind of like a puzzle piece. And that, obviously, if you have lots and lots of structural, 3D structural information, 
you can exquisitely design a drug to fit perfectly, to wedge it right into that pocket that you want to, to block that protein. Um, a great success story in that area are HIV protease inhibitors. It turns out for um, some biochemical reasons that HIV protease is a very, very easy uh, target to get structural information from. Some targets are easier than others. And so there are hundreds and hundreds of 3D structures showing the, the uh, structure of HIV protease, which here is shown in an orange ribbon with a drug attached to it. And that allowed scientists to go from the simpler structure all the way on the bottom left uh, of a natural uh, target of HIV protease uh, in, in your cells to the drug on the bottom right, sequinavir, which is part of the current highly active antiretroviral therapy. And if you squint and kind of look at it carefully, you can kind of see how the molecule on the right was built out of uh, starting with the molecule on the left. But obviously, there was a lot of trial and error and structural information. How about we put a carbon over here? How about we put an oxygen over there? That looks like that'll fit better. Um, and getting the structural data to kind of build it out like a, like a little molecular Legos one bit at a time until you have a really highly active drug. In the last 15 years or so, um, one of the most recent revolutions in the drug industry have been biopharmaceuticals. Biopharmaceuticals can be divided roughly into two categories. One of them are replacing uh, natural molecules in the body that are just not there enough or aren't working right. A great example of that is insulin, um, which is uh, provided uh, to help people manage diabetes. And also antibodies. Antibodies, of course, are natural molecules that our bodies make to fight infection. Uh, but recently, scientists have been able to produce antibodies that artificially uh, target different uh, proteins in the cell that are causing disease, um, either to get the immune system to attack them or just to block them. And Herceptin is a breast cancer drug that is an antibody. Um, there's antibodies now um, being sold for rheumatoid arthritis and lots of different conditions. And these are biological molecules, um, molecules that are similar to the biological molecules your own body makes, but drug developers have learned how to weaponize them to fight disease. There are a lot of advantages of these molecules. Um, since they're mostly identical to natural molecules in the body, you can have a lot fewer side effects um, because um, they're, they're relatively safe and benign to the body. Um, and some of them, like antibodies, can be target, uh, targeted against almost any different processes process. Some of the disadvantages, though, are you can't just grow up a bunch of foxglove and grind it up and extract your drug like you can for digitalis. Um, you have to produce it using some sort of biological source. Um, you can't synthesize it in the lab or isolate it from a natural source. Most can't be taken orally, and that's why insulin uh, and antibody drugs have to be injected. Um, and they usually don't last very long in the body because they're made up of the same types of building blocks that get broken down in your body every day. And they're usually limited to targets on the outside of the cell because they can't really get into cells on their own. Uh, I show a contrast here. On the left, I show two uh, what we call small molecule drugs, kind of regular molecules. Aspirin, which is really tiny, and digitalis, which is kind of on the bigger side. Uh, and I showed their chemical structures earlier in this talk. And then you can see insulin on the right, which is actually a very small biopharmaceutical compared to things like antibodies. You can see, um, just showing their molecular weights here in numbers and showing their relative sizes, these molecules are much larger and more complex than the kind of traditional drug-like molecules that I've been showing you to date uh, uh, so far in this presentation. So I wanted to address um, something that's really emerging. It's not even a drug yet, but it's um, uh, something you've probably heard a lot about in the last couple of years, which are genetic therapies. Um, if you remember anything from your biology classes that you might have taken at Yale at, at Tufts, you might have uh, might remember that um, DNA is where the genetic material is kept. RNA is uh, what determines whether genes are on and off in a particular cell, and the proteins that I've been talking about uh, so far in this presentation are, are what cause the biological changes. And almost all drugs that I've been showing you so far target proteins. They target um, the things that are making the biology happen and blocking them or changing where they are. But new biotechnology, genetic therapies, promise to act at an earlier level, either editing the genome itself, changing the instructions in your cells, 
or at least changing which genes get turned on or off in the cell. So some examples of these are gene therapies, which usually use viruses to deliver missing or broken genes. It's a really interesting area because there were a lot of high profile failures very early on in the 80s and 90s in gene therapies, but um, gene therapies are now uh, back. We've learned how to do uh, gene therapy a lot safer and have much safer viral vectors now. And so, especially for a lot of genetic diseases, um, there's a lot of excitement about gene therapies. Again, um, in clinical trials and preclinical mostly, um, not really at a doctor's office near you, um, but you may have heard about these, so I wanted to talk about them because they're really exciting. Nucleic acid drugs are another area um, where you can turn on or off uh, disease-causing genes. Um, these can even be personalized um, for a very, very specific genetic insult to turn on or off uh, the uh, genetic insult that's happening in a, in a single patient. And finally, CRISPR gene editing, which has gotten a lot of press, which uh, could go in and uh, permanently change the genome itself. Um, CRISPR gene editing is a very useful tool in the lab, and people are very excited about its prospects for long, uh, over the long term for uh, disease therapies. But it's uh, very much still a bio biological tool um, and not really in clinical trials um, because they're very hard to deliver, um, and the side effects have not been evaluated yet. Once you start messing with someone ge someone's genome, those changes are permanent, and so you really want to make sure you have the safety worked out before you try these kinds of things in humans. But these are um, definitely things that we're very, very excited about and um, starting to either uh, just start to be used in humans or um, expect to see uh, the first clinical trials in these different areas um, over the next few years. OK, finally, uh, the last part of my talk will focus on current challenges in drug discovery. I'll remind you that um, drug companies really have one, uh, have, really have three uh, tasks in front of them to find these new and useful molecules, to test them for safety and efficacy, and then manufacture them for sale. So again, trying to do a little bit of question and answer, which one of these steps do you think is the most difficult or most limiting nowadays for drug development? Is it finding those molecules? Is it actually preparing the molecules themselves, synthesizing them, purifying them? Is it uh, bureaucracy, patent, and regulatory cost? Or is it testing the drugs in humans to see if they're safe and effective? The answer here is by far testing drugs in humans. Um, that is the uh, most difficult and limiting step by far for drug development in the modern age. This is uh, what the drug discovery process looks like. Um, there's a lot of preclinical work, um, which is the first two or three uh, graphics here where you're testing molecules in mice or in test tubes. Um, but at some point, um, you file an IND, an investigational new drug application with the FDA, using all your animal data and biological data. And they agree, OK, you can test that drug in humans. What happens next? You do what's called a phase one clinical trial. A phase one clinical trial does almost always measures simply toleration. Basically, you take some very, very healthy, um, uh, hungry college students who need the money, and you pay them to come week after week and get escalating dose of your drug until they report adverse side effects, and then you stop. That sounds very crazy, but that is exactly how what a phase one drug trial is, um, just to make sure that the safety is there before you give it to somebody to try to treat any disease. Phase two clinical studies then look for efficacy give it to a small number of patients, you have a control group, and you make sure that your drug actually improves that condition for those patients. Phase three studies then expands that to a large patient population. Depending on what your indication is, it can be very large indeed. For instance, if you're trying to treat heart disease, you might have to do phase three trials in thousands or tens of thousands of people um, because if you expect millions of people to be on your drug, you need to detect very, very small side effects that might um, be a problem for a very small subset of the population. And that's why those clinical studies are the most expensive part of drug development is because it takes a lot of doctors and a lot of uh, tests to do those clinical trials. 
And the job of the preclinical uh, side is to make sure that the most promising molecules with the most firm biological basis enter clinical trials, because when a drug fails clinical trials, it costs a lot of money that will never be recovered. So why is drug discovery so difficult? Why is there this danger of having all this data in animals and in test tubes and then it just fails in humans? Um, I'd like to show some scary pictures from my biochemistry class. So this is what metabolism looks like. This is what growth signaling looks like. But really, these are just kind of security blankets to make us feel good about ourselves as academics, because the truth is we just know so little about biology, so little about how human cells and the human body works. Um, that taking anything into humans is always a risk. It's always a risk that you don't understand the biology well enough, and it's just not going to work in humans, even though it worked in mice or it worked in a test tube. Um, and so, you know, the more that we can learn about biology, the more that we can um, have successful drug trials. So, um, open questions in drug discovery are, um, you know, currently we can use our knowledge of biology to pick a cellular target first. Uh, we can pick the, 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 we can think we know enough about the biology to basically call our shot and point to that protein and say, hey, protein X, you know, I'm going to block protein X and that's going to uh, be effective for this disease. But is that wise considering we may not really be as confident in that biology as, as you might think? Also, uh, current uh, ways of developing drugs can only target a small subset of what's going on in the cell. Can we target anything in the cell? Can we target uh, nucleic acids? Can we target the genome? And most importantly, can we uh, correct this, um, this uh, disaster outcome that happens almost two out of three times, which is that drugs fail relatively late in clinical trials? Can we lower this failure rate somehow? Is there something we can do in a test tube, in animal models, um, to uh, be much more sure about our molecules succeeding before we go into human clinical trials. Um, so before I conclude, I'd like to talk a little bit about the research going on in, in my lab here at Tufts. Uh, so I run a research lab of about 15 uh, full-time researchers, including a whole bunch of amazing Tufts undergrads and grad students. Um, my lab develops new types of molecules to go after uh, mo uh, proteins in the body that have been dismissed by the drug uh, industry as undruggable. This is a really um, excellent area to be an academic in because these are very risky proteins. I just told you that, um, you know, target selection and making sure you're, that you understand the biology is the number one key for having a successful clinical trial. Uh, and so I get to go after really risky targets um, where the biology isn't very well known. Another thing that we do is, is design molecules that control autophagy. This is a great example of a process that's very, very exciting. It's a cellular recycling process by which uh, cells can recycle their material. It's a very healthy thing for cells to do, and we'd like to promote it in a lot of uh, cells to combat a lot of diseases. But the basic biology behind autophagy is very poorly understood. And so we design new molecules that we think will actually help illuminate the biology behind autophagy, not to mention potentially be uh, a generation of drugs that control autophagy. And finally, some more basic science that my lab does that um, promotes drug discovery is measuring cell penetration of biotherapeutics. You take an antibody or a nucleic acid or something else and you throw it on the outside of the cell and you want it to enter the cell and change what that cell is doing, whether you're killing cancer cells or forcing cells to produce insulin. You want to know how much of that molecule is getting into cells, and that was actually a very, very difficult uh, experiment to do. And so my lab has generated new, uh, new tests and new ways of measuring uh, how much of your molecule, how much of your drug molecule is actually getting into cells. And you can read more about my lab um, at the link at the bottom of this page. So that concludes um, my prepared slides on drug discovery. Hopefully I gave you a little bit of indication of how drugs work. Um, some of the history of drug development. Um, methods of drug discovery, I talked everything from natural products, which, um, which goes back to ancient times and is still done today, all the way through to uh, biopharmaceuticals and genetic therapies, which are um, 
translating from the bench to the bedside as we speak. And finally, some of the current challenges in drug discovery and the current things that my own uh, lab, research lab is working on. I'd really love to get questions. Uh, you can ask questions using the Q&A box. Just type them right in, um, and I'll read them out and then try to answer them as well as that I can. If you'd like to learn more, um, here are some resources, some books, and some excellent websites um, that you can use to, to uh, read more about drug development. So I'm going to get some questions here. I'm going to start answering them. Is gene therapy used for both cancer treatment and treating uh, chronic disease? So that's a great question. Uh, gene therapy, uh, it's interesting because we've had the human genome sequenced for almost 20 years now. And, uh, and yet the genome hasn't uh, produced um, therapies directly because we still have to know what to change and how that's going to affect the biology. Like I said, the greatest barrier is really understanding the biology. So even if we could reach in and change genes, changing one gene to affect a really complicated chronic disorder like uh, diabetes or heart disease is going to be really difficult. Where gene therapy is seeing the most traction right now is treating um, single uh, diseases that can be traced to a defect in a single gene. So a great example uh, is phenylketonuria or PKU, which is a genetic disease where uh, individuals are born without a specific protein in the cells that's needed to break down uh, phenylalanine. And so that's a great example where we know, understand the biology enough to know that we can make one change in one gene and uh, affect that disease directly. So that's why it's much more uh, promising for genetic diseases uh, rather than chronic disease. How are you and your lab collaborating with uh, academic institutions and or industry? That's a great question because there's a ton of collaboration all over between academics and industry, uh, and my lab is no different. So we've partnered with um, small biotechs and large drug companies alike uh, in some of the areas that we work in, um, in the autophagy controlling drugs, um, and especially measuring cell penetration. Um, we've provided a lot of tools and basic understanding um, that we have, uh, can collaborate with drug companies and biotechnology companies to advance their own products and their own questions. Um, and I've had really great collaborations and continue to have great collaborations with um, drug companies uh, all over Boston and all over the country. I mentioned that insulin is a biopharmaceutical, but it's been around such a long time. Why is the cost increasing? That is a great question, and it gets into a little bit more uh, of the business side of drug development rather than the science side. Um, insulin's actually been around for over 100 years since it was shown that you could inject uh, dogs with insulin and show that it, you could manage their, um, their diabetes that way. Um, but as I mentioned, insulin can't be uh, synthesized uh, in the lab. It has to be produced from a biological source. And so the sourcing of insulin is very, very difficult. It has to, uh, there's a lot of checks you have to do to make sure that that insulin is then safe. Um, it, it, isn't, uh, it has a shorter shelf life than a pill that can just be on the counter. Um, it has to be injected. And so there's a lot of um, checks that you have to do, quality control that you have to do on insulin that makes it very expensive to produce and distribute um, and so then that gets into the business models that different companies have to produce such a complicated and expensive product and then try to get profit at the end of that. How have I seen the FDA approval process change in my career? Do I have any thoughts on how to make the process more efficient? That's a great question because um, a lot of times you hear people saying that, you know, the FDA is getting in the way of promising therapies and while no bureaucracy is perfect and there could always be um, some streamlining, I think the major story of the FDA going all the way back to its inception in the 1960s um, is that it's um, really, really important to scientifically prove safety and efficacy. Um, you notice that the FDA doesn't require perfect knowledge of everything that your drug is doing, but it does require you to have kind of a control group to show that your drug does better than the current therapy or the current, and does not harm people. And I think it's really, really important to appreciate how difficult a question that is to answer. 
Um, the FDA does have a fast track program um, that is uh, being used for really important therapies. And so I do think that the FDA process works really, really well. But of course, there are a lot of ways that it could be improved. Given that the biggest hurdle is testing in humans, how do I feel about fast track development programs that may reduce the amount of studies or testing in humans? What are the risks and benefits? This is a fantastic question. Um, and I think that the, the last part of that question is really the most important part. What are the risks and what are the benefits? I think there are a lot of benefits to fast tracking um, therapies in humans when there are no other available therapies. Um, genetic diseases, cancers that have been uh, shown to be resistant to current chemotherapies, um, antibiotics um, for antibiotic resistant bacteria where the existing antibiotics have been exhausted. These are all great areas where the risk probably, uh, the benefits probably outweigh the risk because you have a person who doesn't have another therapy to turn to. Um, but for other things, for chronic conditions where there are management regimes, are therapies, I think it's really, really hard to say we should speed that process up because the potential risks are just huge if you have millions of people taking an untested therapy. What are the major causes of drug failures late in clinical trials? That's a great question. I guess you're, you're looking for more granularity than just you know, this, this analogy with a, a, a really complex system. I mean, the truth is we really don't understand human biology. You know, animal testing is controversial, but it's the best thing we have to mimic, mimic a human body before we get there. And even then, you know, mouse physiology is not the same as human physiology. So you know, we try to do every single test that we can do before we uh, put a drug in a human being um, to see whether, um, whether it's likely to work. But in the end, you really just don't know whether it's going to work in the human body until you put it in there. Um, the human body is not a computer. It's very poorly understood. Um, we know a small fraction of how, the, uh, of how human biology works. And so um, at some point, it really is a leap of faith to go into humans and hope that everything that you've worked for up until that point will continue to work when you actually test it in human beings. For a tough student, what is the course selection or progression to move towards a career in drug discovery? That's a fantastic question. Um, I advise a lot of tough students, both as a research advisor and uh, teaching uh, organic chemistry and um, biochemistry classes. Um, and we get a lot of biology majors, chemistry majors, biochemistry majors who are interested in careers in drug development. Um, students, uh, we have a, a really robust undergraduate research program. Uh, summer scholars and other uh, generous programs support students to do research over the summer. Um, we can, um, there's always um, more students who want to do research in our labs than we can support. Uh, and students get a hands-on training in the types of research that I was telling you about that goes on in my lab um, to the point where uh, I have, uh, in all three of these projects, I have undergraduates who are running their own projects and are going to publish their own papers as undergraduates uh, in these cutting-edge areas of drug development. And so, you know, Tufts is a fantastic place both for coursework and even to get out of the classroom and into the research lab um, where there are hundreds of Tufts students actually doing research relevant to drug discovery right now. I've had a couple questions asking me to talk a little bit about immunotherapy, and that's great. That's uh, something that you've, uh, if you uh, read about drug development, you've probably noticed has been uh, a lot of excitement around, especially in the area of cancer. Um, something that's interesting about uh, my, uh, my warning that we know so little about, about, about biology is even 15 years ago, the idea that, um, that cancer had to evade the immune system, that the immune system doesn't just patrol your body looking for bacteria and viruses, that the immune system actually patrols your body looking for cancer um, was controversial among biologists, among cancer biologists. But once that was proven, then what you could do is sensitize the immune system, basically um, block some of the um, checks that are on the immune system, rev the immune system up to say, hey, you know what? I think you should look a little more closely because there might be cancer over there. 
Um, and that's what some of these so-called checkpoint inhibitors do um, that are leading uh, kind of a revolution in cancer immunotherapy. So this is a great example where basic biology done at academic institutions around the country um, led to a revolution in cancer immunotherapy, which is still going on today, basically with just the general idea of, hey, how, you know, are we sure that the immune system isn't a check against cancer, that it's just viruses and bacteria? And once that was shown, um, it was a pretty straight line from there to, to figure out what levers you could push and pull on the immune system to get it to um, go after cancer. As I mentioned, I've been here at Tufts for 10 years. I've been teaching um, biochemistry and organic chemistry to hundreds and hundreds of Tufts undergraduates. I really uh, love the combination of teaching and scholarship that I can do here at Tufts, where I can be in the classroom on Monday and then be in the lab on Tuesday, um, and then talk to a bunch of uh, interested alumni on Wednesday.